welcome all to the fourth session in this year's Prayer Book Society Lent series, Thy Chosen Servant, The Rite of Coronation. My name is Ian Milne and I'm a trustee of the Prayer Book Society and I'm chairing this evening's session. As usual, please do take a note of questions or write them into the chat box and we'll have time to take those at the end. I'll explain how we'll do that when we get to that, but during the presentation, uh, we'd be grateful if you would keep yourselves muted. The Prayer Book Society is encouraging serious preparation for what is a serious religious event with a history intimately bound up with that of the prayer book and the church in the British Isles and beyond. With that in mind, let us remember to pray regularly for our King, for the Royal Family, for the bishops and curates of the Church of England and for all those making arrangements for his, our, his, our King's coronation and those serving in many other weighty responsibilities in the early months of his reign. Praying now together a prayer from the accession service. Let us pray. O God, who providest for thy people by thy power and rulest over them in love, vouchsafe so to bless thy servant, our King, that under him this nation may be wisely governed and thy church may serve thee in all godly quietness and grant that he, being devoted to thee with his whole heart and persevering in good works unto the end, may, by thy guidance, come to thine everlasting kingdom through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. We welcome the Reverend Dr. Ian Bradley for a presentation on Reflections on Coronations 1661 to 1953. Ian has worked for the BBC and the Times, amongst others, he was ordained in the Church of Scotland in 1990 and has written and taught extensively, serving as principal of St Mary's College in the University of St Andrews and as a professor of divinity at the same seat of learning. And since his retirement, publishing yet further works and making yet further broadcasts, including available from the Prayer Book Society shop, <laughs> Save the King, the Sacred Nature of Monarchy. Uh, please do pay attention to the talk rather than turning straight to purchase your copy if you don't have one already. Without further ado, Dr Bradley, uh, please do begin your talk. We're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much indeed, Ian, and, and thank you very much for inviting me. I may say I have a, a abiding lifelong attachment to the, the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, as you say, I'm a minister in the Church of Scotland, but as my accent probably tells you, I grew up in the south of England. And although my mother had me taken up to uh, Scotland to be properly baptized in the Kirk, I was confirmed in the Church of England by um, somebody, some of you may remember, I think almost one of the longest serving bishops in the Church of England, David Say, who was Bishop of Rochester for a long time, and I suspect probably a, a prayer book man, I don't know, but I was confirmed by him. And I have here the, the my copy of the Book of Common Prayer that I've had since my teenage days in the mid 60s. And I think I bought it in a secondhand bookshop, interestingly, it bears the the um, inscription. There's there's my name and and uh, but it's the Church of St Edward, King and Martyr, very appropriately. Now I didn't pinch it from uh, a church um, of King Edward, um, King and Martyr. But some of you will know better than me where they are. There's one in um, Cambridge. There's one in. Castle Donington, but I, I bought it in a second-hand bookshop, I can assure you, I didn't pitch it from a church, but it was came rather appropriately, given um, what I'm talking about, from a church dedicated to, to Edward, uh, King and Martyr, and I've, I've been very attached to the prayer book. One of the great advantages, as you probably know, of being a minister in the Church of Scotland is that we have no um, set liturgy, and so we can, we can use whatever we like, and I don't think I'm the only minister in the Church of Scotland who does um, at times use the Book of Common Prayer for, for worship, and it's, as I'm sure you know, you have several members, uh, including a, a good friend of mine who's a Church of Scotland elder, who's a, a member of the Prayer Book Society, so it's very much appreciated uh, in the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, um, uh, and, and I would be one who, who does quite often have recourse to it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today with, with the, um, the blessing of the other Bradley, Bradley, uh, Bradley Smith, um, and we've got another Ian as well, so we, we cover all the bases tonight, is just to um, 
share with you some reflections that have been made about coronations over the last um, uh, 350 years or so. This forms part of my book that, that Ian's already given a, a very nice plug to. So those of you who've bought it, I hope will bear with me because it may, may be uh, rather familiar. But one of the chapters in my book, God Save the King, I have a whole section in the book on the coronation, on the, the history of the coronation, the significance of it, the symbolism of, of all its elements. And um, I find myself doing a lot about that at the moment. I'm doing a a broadcast for BBC Radio Ulster tomorrow about it. I've just done a piece for the, the Roman Catholic magazine, the tablet for this week's issue, and um, also four pieces for a new um, Christian Church of England website that some of you will be familiar with, run, run from Lambeth Palace. Um, and uh, so I'm thinking a lot about it, but this is, this is really taking reflections on it. Um, and uh, coronations, as we know, are occasions for reflecting on and affirming the sacred meaning of monarchy, which is something I've been very attached to for a long time and have written several books about. Um, and I hope very much this is going to be the case with the, the upcoming coronation of, of Charles III and, and Queen Camilla. Um, what I do in this talk is to gather together some reflections prompted by previous coronations, both from Christian leaders and also more secularly minded commentators. And it is interesting, I think, that um, coronations seem to inspire, even in those one might think of as being very secular, um, religious and, and spiritual reflections. And let's hope that happens uh, on, on the 6th of May and, and thereafter. Um, I begin with words from a famous diarist, um, which point to the sheer splendor and significance uh, of coronations and the extent to which they linger in the mind and change perspectives. After attending the, the English coronation of Charles II, remember, of course, that the Stuart monarchs were crowned both in England and in Scotland, and in one case in Scotland, according to the, the right of the Book of Common Prayer, but this was after the English coronation of Charles II in 1661. He had a much earlier Scottish coronation in Schoon, where he was subjected to a three-hour Presbyterian sermon, um, but this is the, the English coronation, with, with the prayer book, of course, being used. Samuel Pepys wrote, now after all this, I can say that besides the pleasure of the sight of these glorious things, I may now shut my eyes against any other objects or for the future trouble myself to see things of state and show as being sure never to see the like again in this world. Jumping forward to the 19th century, the evangelical uh, politician and philanthropist uh, Lord Ashley, later the Earl of Shaftesbury, famous for his work in factory reform. Um, sorry, I've just lost my, uh, I think I'm back again now, sorry. Um, Lord Shaftesbury was similarly moved um, to by Queen Victoria's coronation, feeling its spiritual power and reflecting on those who dismissed it as an idle pageant. And this is what he wrote, an idle pageant forsooth, as idle as the coronation of King Solomon or the dedication of his temple. The service itself refutes the notion so solemn, so deeply religious, so humbling, and yet so sublime. Every word of it is invaluable, Throughout the church is everything, secular greatness, nothing. She declares in the name and by the authority of God and almost enforces as a condition preliminary to the benediction, all that can make princes wise to temporal and eternal glory. And then looking ahead to the coronation that never was, the a coronation uh, that was going to be for Edward VIII in 1936. Alfred Blunt, who was Bishop of Bradford, emphasized the significance and implications of the ceremony for the population at large. And what I think is a quite an unusual, but a very important observation. He wrote, whatever it may mean to the individual who is crowned, to the people as a whole, it means the dedication of the English monarchy to the care of God in whose rule and governance are the hearts of kings, not only as important as, but far more important than the king's personal feelings are to his coronation, is the feeling which we, 
the people of England view it. One part of the ceremony is to fill it with reality. Our part, sorry, of the ceremony is to fill it with reality by the sincerity of our belief in the power of God to overrule for good our national history and by the sincerity with which we commend the king and the nation to his providence. Are we going to be merely spectators or listeners in as at any other interesting function with a sort of passive curiosity? Or are we in some sense going to consecrate ourselves to the service of God and the welfare of humankind? Very interestingly, I think the way he, he puts the whole emphasis on our popular involvement and response to the coronation. And this challenging statement about the extent to which the coronation requires popular buy-in, to use the, uh, the popular contemporary term, is unusual. Though it, it chimes, of course, with the whole idea of the, coron of, of the three-way covenant between God, monarch, and people, which, of course, is there fundamentally in Israelite monarchy and very much reinforced uh, in, in our coronation, in our whole understanding, of course, of, of British monarchy, that there is a three-way covenant between God, the people, and the monarch. Um, in somewhat similar vein, um, I suspect I wasn't the only person, and probably many of you who are present here, to preach a sermon in the aftermath of the death of our much loved and much mourned late queen, suggesting that the best way that we could honor her memory and express our appreciation of her was to dedicate ourselves to that kind of stoical, sacrificial, ungrumbling and unfussy service which she displayed throughout her reign. More common than that, that reflection by the, the Bishop of Bradford in 1936 about, as it were, our involvement, more common have been reflections on the consecration and dedication of those being anointed and crowned. This is how the Times expressed it uh, in its leader on the day of George VI's coronation in 1937. Nothing is heard nowadays of the divine right and not since the last of the Stuarts, Queen Anne, has any sovereign of England been credited with the magical touch for the cure of the king's evil. Yet seeing the king thus exalted at this most solemn moment above common humanity, the mind's eye may catch beyond all the pomp another vision. It is the vision to hush the enthusiasm, but only in order to deepen the feeling of loyalty and turn goodwill into prayer. The king is on his way to be enthroned, indeed, and acclaimed. The trumpets will sound, and the people will cry out, God save King George. But he is on his way also to be consecrated, to be dedicated. Once that is done, he is no longer an ordinary man. He is a man dedicated something that I make a lot of in my book, as we know, in a sense, the most sacred, solemn, important part of the coronation will be the anointing of King Charles and of his, uh, the Queen Camilla, uh, going right back, of course, to the anointing of King Solomon. We will hear the choir singing Handel's stirring setting of Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. And the Times leader in 1937 went on to discuss the primal pagan idea of the ritual sacrifice of the king. In the modern world, it said the king is dedicated to a harder sacrifice. Day in and day out, for his people, he must live. The more closely the burden of kingship is looked at, the more impossible does it seem that any man should bear it unless he were sustained and fortified and inspired by the spiritual power conferred on him in Westminster Abbey today. For its leader on Coronation Day 1953, the Times returned to the primal image of the monarch as the incarnation of his people, a phrase used by Archbishop William Temple in connection with the coronation of George V, while also reiterating the point that Bishop Blunt had made um, about the participation of the entire population. This is what the Times wrote on Coronation Day 1953. Today's sublime ceremonial 
is in form and in common view a dedication of the state to God's service through the prayers and benedictions of the church. That is a noble conception and of itself makes every man and woman in the land a partaker in the mystery of the queen's anointing. But also the queen stands for the soul as well as the body of the commonwealth. In her is incarnate on her coronation day, the whole of society of which the state is no more than a political manifestation. She represents the life of her people as men and women and not in their limited capacity as lords and commons and electors. It is the glory of the social monarchy that it sets the human above the institutional. Sorry, I've got a rather um, in, 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 indistinct visual aid here, which is uh, a model of our late queen uh, sitting on um, King Edward's throne, St. Edward's, St. Edward's throne, of course, built by Edward I with the stone of destiny below it, um, holding up the, the rod and staff with which, of course, King Charles will be invested. Some of many of you will know this rather wonderful Britain set of um, figures representing the, the 1953 coronation. One hopes there might be a, a set produced for the coronation of King Charles. I haven't heard anything about it yet, but perhaps some of you have. Now, there is a danger, obviously, in over-spiritualizing the coronation and using somewhat hyperbolic language about its significance. On the day of Queen Elizabeth's coronation in 1953, Geoffrey Fisher, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury then, solemnly announced that England had been brought closer to the kingdom of heaven. And another senior cleric de uh, declared that it was a miracle that might save civilization. Um, the, the prominent humanist and socialist journalist Kingsley Martin was probably justified in observing that extravagant views of monarchy are usually expressed at coronations. Um, other secular commentators criticized the 1953 coronation for being altogether too religious in tone um, in his trenchant attack on the monarchy in general and the queen in particular for being totally out of touch. Uh, published in 1958, John Grigg, newly ennobled as Lord Altrincham, complained that the coronation had emphasized the priestly aspect of her office and the ensuing period had she continued to appear more sacerdotal than secular. Um, and there, there were others, of course, who made the same point that it was altogether too religious. The sacerdotal emphasis had been too much. And, and um, John Grigg, of course, famously described the Queen as, as being altogether too, too uh, sacerdotal and serious. But actually, in general, it's very interesting that journalists um, and authors writing about the last coronation in 1953 actually tended to acknowledge and welcome its sacred character. Uh, the former Times religious affairs correspondent, an old colleague of mine when we were both on the Times and subsequently columnist for the Daily Telegraph and the tablet, Clifford Longley, said the coronation of our Queen was an act of God performed by human hands and the assembly held its breath at the mystery and wonder of it. It was one of the central acts of statehood, the moment whereby all temporal authority in the realm flowing from the king was legitimized and sanctified. This is the doctrine of Christian kingship. And perhaps more surprisingly, the somewhat cynical and world weary Jeremy Paxman found himself in his book, which some of you may have read, his book, 2006 book on royalty, acknowledging and affirming the religious character of the coronation and its testimony to the essential sacred nature of monarchy. And this is what Paxman wrote, perhaps not what you'd particularly expect um, from him. The ceremony's function, he said, is to knit together the elements of acclamation with the fact that the monarch is already king or queen simply because his or her predecessor has died. For hundreds of years in Britain, these potentially contradictory elements have been reconciled by a ritual which is conspicuously and overwhelmingly religious. It is a Christian spectacular with the elders of the church pressing in around the new king or queen and the state allowed access only through the mediation of the clergy. 
The echoes of the Christ story are not merely implied, but explicit, which is why the only appropriate setting for the ritual is a religious one. Without it, the coronation would be a meaningless piece of civic theater. And Paxman goes on, cold reasoning says there is no reason why a king should not assume office in a ceremony shorn of religious ritual and anachronistic flummery. And of course, one might point out here, as I do in the book, we are the only country left uh, which has a monarchy which still has a coronation. All the other European monarchies have abandoned coronations. The last to do so was Norway, which still has a religious service of blessing in Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim, but it does not involve a, a crowning or an anointing. The regalia are there, but they're not, they're not actually used. Paxman goes on, an impresario who attempted to stage such an event, in other words, a non-religious uh, coronation uh, for a king, would find himself having to address some very awkward questions. In wealthy Western societies, the idea of the sacred has been steadily impoverished ever since the Industrial Revolution. Monarchy is almost the last institution in the land to which any mystique attaches. Indeed, the mystique is the most powerful guarantor of its survival. To remove those elements from the ritual of enthronement might well lead the institution so exposed that it would wither and die. And Paxman went on to reflect that monarchs stand for something beyond themselves, and in that sense are less political creatures than religious ones, and that there is certainly an argument for saying that royalty can be properly understood only in religious terms. A wonderful statement, I, I could have wrote, written those words myself, and indeed I, I claim a tiny little bit of credit. The, the only conversation I had with Jeremy Paxman was when I had preached before the Queen at, at Crathy Church, and I'd written about it, and he was very taken with this, and he interviewed me, and in fact, he quotes me in the book, because my point is exactly his point, that essentially we need to see monarchy as something religious um, rather than, than secular, and, and something that points beyond itself to, to, to God. And he took this on board, and I think it's, it's very interesting that somebody who we tend to think of as, as certainly in his earlier days when he when he wrote this, a, a rather sort of cynical political commentator, is, is very much on board with this whole idea of the religious sacred dimension of monarchy. Perhaps the most uh, profound and in some ways the most surprising reflections on this topic come from an academic article, some of you may know because it's, it's quite often quoted and I've often quoted it myself, about the meaning of the 1953 coronation, which was written by two left-leaning politically um, sociologists, Edward Schills and Michael Young, in the Sociological Review in 1953. And you might expect them, given their background, to be rather cynical about the religious aspects of the coronation, but far from it. For them, the coronation was the ceremonial occasion for the affirmation of the moral values by which society lives. And I quote their words here, it was an act of national communion and an intensive contact with the sacred. And their argument was based in part on their observation of the coronation's impact on, on so-called ordinary people. Um, they noted it was frequently spoken of as an inspiration, as a rededication of the nation. Um, the ceremony had touched the sense of the sacred in people, heightening a sense of solidarity in both families and communities. They pointed, for example, um, to examples of reconciliation of uh, between long feuding neighbors and family members who were brought together by the shared experience of watching the coronation. Of course, so many people, it's the first time many people had watched television and, and they interviewed a lot of people and found a lot of actual examples, as I say, of, of people who had been for some reason estranged or hostile actually coming together because of their shared experience of, of watching the coronation. Um, and they noted that the crowds lining the streets of London on Coronation Day were not idle curiosity seekers, but looking for contact with something which is connected with the sacred. Um, I think very much the same happened 
in the aftermath of the death of um, Her Late Majesty. Um, I was extremely taken by the fact that both the crowds uh, gathered to watch the, the, the procession of, of the hearse through Scotland and then through the streets of Edinburgh and then down from, from the airport to London and then to Windsor, um, and those who were filing past her coffin in the High Kirk of St Giles in Edinburgh and in Westminster Hall, very often crossed themselves bowed, made some essentially religious gesture. And it was very clear that those standing, as some of them did for hours and hours uh, to file past the coffin, often described themselves as being on pilgrimage. Um, I talked to some of the chaplains who worked with them and, and spoke uh, of their desire to have prayers and, and blessings. And there was a palpable sense of the sacred the sacred dimension of monarchy. Um, it's something that struck me very strongly and I have written about, and indeed I, I write about it in the book. And these two sociologists, um, Edward Shields, who was professor of sociology at the Sociology of the University of Chicago, and um, Michael Young, who was a former research secretary uh, of the Labour Party, argued that Elizabeth II's coronation had enabled people to affirm moral values, notably generosity, charity, loyalty, justice in the distribution of opportunities and rewards, reasonable respect for authority, the dignity of the individual, and the right to freedom. And they felt that the sacred properties and charisma of the crown strengthened the moral consensus um, prevailing in Britain. They said the monarchy is the one pervasive institution standing above all others, which plays a part in a vital way comparable to the function of the medieval church, the function of integrating diverse elements into a whole by protecting and defining their autonomy. And as I say, these statements are not coming from uh, churchmen or monarchists, they're coming from left-wing sociologists who are particularly struck by the, the morally cohesive effect uh, produced by the actual form of the coronation service with its language, of course, couched in the Book of Common Prayer, as you well know, it's framed in a Book of Common Prayer communion service. And, and um, they says the coronation is a series of ritual affirmations of the moral values necessary to a well-governed and good society. The key to the coronation service is the Queen's promise, in our case, of course, the King's promise to abide by the moral standards of society. And they singled out the, the coronation oaths um, as being important, the act of anointing, which I've already mentioned, the investiture with the bracelets of sincerity and wisdom, which I hope we're not going to lose. There are hints that we're going to lose um, some of the regalia. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. I hope we don't lose them. And with the orb and the the sword, uh, which I don't think we are going to lose. Um, and um, th th these are rightly regarded by them, not just as symbolic, which they are, but as transformative in bringing the queen and people into a great nationwide communion. The coronation they concluded provided at one time and for practically the entire society, such an intensive contact with the sacred that we believe we are justified in interpreting it as we have done as a great act of national communion. Uh, the little um, further, sorry, it's very, um, very indistinct, but here's the, the Archbishop of Canterbury with the crown um, in, in, the, uh, in that series of, of models. Well, will future sociologists and commentators write in similar terms about the coronation that we are preparing for on the 6th of May? We are obviously a much more fractured and secular and diverse society now than we were 70 years ago. Yet perhaps for that very reason, the coronation of Charles III may speak to and partially answer that yearning for unity and healing and spirituality, which I think is so manifestly felt by so many in our country now. Um, Shields and Young noted that the 1953 coronation service, stage managed, of course, by the Church of England, as the, uh, the coronation will be on the 6th of May, but probably with much wider ecumenical participation. This is something I've been doing quite a lot of research into and got a certain number of uh, 
hints about, and I, I write about it in my tablet piece this week. Uh, they say that it served the vague religiosity of the British people. That vague religiosity is surely still there, latent, sometimes often not really articulated, but ready to be inspired and touched. I think the late Queen's death undoubtedly released it. I, I've had very interesting conversations with people in some of the major English cathedrals who witnessed a huge influx of people. Many of them would not identify themselves as Christian believers. Indeed, in Manchester Cathedral, there was a, there was a huge number of Muslims who came in in the aftermath of the Queen's death because they wanted somewhere to pray and somewhere to reflect about this extraordinary woman and this extraordinary reign. And um, I think the Queen's death released uh, the, the great latent spirituality and which I think exists in the British people, not expressed in church going as, as we know, but maybe too her son's coronation will. Um, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see. We don't, of course, yet have the full details of the service. We, we, we know what crown Camilla will be wearing. We know she's not going to be uh, flashing the Koh-i-Noor diamond. We, we know exactly who's going to be in the, uh, in the way of grandchildren and who's in the procession. Um, we, we know, obviously, that it's going to be in Westminster Abbey, that it's going to be framed within a Book of Common Prayer uh, communion service. Um, we know the anointing is, is definitely happening because, of course, the oil's already been blessed in Jerusalem. Um, there will almost certainly be more ecumenical participation. Um, I think my own moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, who was, of course, the only non-Anglican to be involved in the 1953 coronation. Um, I think the current moderator, Ian Greenshields, will uh, have the same role that the moderator did in 1953 of presenting the Bible authorized version, one hopes, to the, uh, to the king. Um, I think there will almost certainly be Roman Catholic and free church participation in terms of the prayers. I am predicting there will also be Orthodox participation. Uh, as we know, King Charles has, has a great affinity for the Orthodox Church. Um, and uh, he, he, of course, has already commissioned, we know, uh, an Orthodox chant, which is going to be sung. And I would be very surprised if the uh, Greek uh, Orthodox Archbishop is, is not involved in some way. It's worth noting in passing, and I only discovered this um, last week, actually, when I was in Vienna from some Siberian Orthodox, that May the 6th, the day of the coronation, and some of you may know this, is the day when many in the Orthodox Church celebrate the um, feast of um, St. George. And it is the day when the monks of Mount Athos, where, of course, King Charles has gone on retreat on a number of occasions, celebrate the um, feast of, of um, St. George. So one just wonders if there's, if there's any significance there as to why the 6th of May was, was chosen for the, the coronation. I just throw that out as an interesting coincidence, if you like. Um, I've already said we, we don't know what regalia are going to be used. Um, and there have been hints, strong hints, um, that some of the, the medieval um, which some describe as anachronistic mumbo jumbo like the arm mills and the bracelets will will not be used now i would be very sorry if this happens because i think they have enormous significance the, the spurs they stand for values of chivalry uh the the arm mills the bracelets for for valor for justice for honor there are the swords of course um there are all the vestments with which the monarch is usually vested, um, which one hopes won't be abandoned. We, we haven't heard about that yet, but they, of course, point to the sacerdotal significance of monarchy and have huge significance. Um, we, we just don't know. Um, press reports have suggested that a number of rituals, including the presentation of gold ingots, will be removed. Now, not quite clear what that is. As you probably know, in past coronations, the monarch has actually made a, an ablation of gold in in, in God's before taking communion to the altar. And maybe this is going to be abandoned, although it would seem strange, but we, we don't quite know what this means um, or whether it's the, the, the investiture with, with our mills. Um, Rowan Williams, who was involved, of course, in discussions about the shape of the coronation uh, during his time as Archbishop of Canterbury, has been quoted as saying 
that the Gilbert and Sullivan aspects of the coronation will go. Now, I trust, and um, I'm probably not the only one of you who's a Gilbert and Sullivan fan, and my old friend, uh, Father Philip Corbett, maybe, maybe uh, on this Zoom call. I Greetings to you, Philip, if you are, and I know you've, you've already done one of these talks, which I shall look forward to seeing. But I trust that what Rowan Williams was referring to here was the, the doffing of caps by serried ranks of peers, uh, doffing their coronets, as they, one might get in Ireland, uh, rather than the allusions to, to medieval uh, chivalry that one might get in the Yeoman of the Guard, because for me, the significance of the regalia, medieval, um, is, I think, very profound, and I think also very relevant to an age like ours, which is so visual. Young people who are on Instagram and don't tend to like reading a lot, but, but are very taken with the visual and they're into things like Dungeons and Dragons and Game of Thrones. I think um, medieval um, objects will have a huge impact for people who've been brought up on the Lord of the Rings and, and, uh, um, and, and so on. And I think it would be terrible if we, if we throw it out. And I think this, this so-called medieval mumbo, mumbo jumbo that some people object to actually uh, might have a, a considerable relevance. And I just want to end with my final reflection and then very happy to take any questions, which comes from uh, Cosmo Gordon Lang, uh, a good Scotsman, of course, who was Archbishop of Canterbury just before he presided over the coronation of George VI. Um, and he was described by Time magazine as the most important person there, a hawk-nosed old gentleman with a cream and gold coat. And this is what he wrote, and I would echo it strongly today. Some persons may ask, many more may think, are not all these ancient rites and ceremonies quite out of place in this modern world? The question surely argues a singular lack of imagination, of that faculty which visualizes the significance of history. It is no mere paradox to say that the very merit and meaning of these rites is precisely that they are, in a sense, out of date. How could the wonderful stability and continuity of the national history be more impressively shown? But in another sense, they are most truly, to use the common phrase, up to date, Consider the world around us. Ancient empires and monarchies vanished, new dictatorships created, everywhere restlessness and uncertainty about the future. In the midst, our king is to be crowned with the same rights as those with which his predecessors have been crowned for more than a thousand years. Moreover, although the forms are old, the spirit embodied and the words attached to them are never old, and may ever be renewed. The spirit is the solemn recognition of the sacred character alike of royalty and loyalty, that the powers that be are ordained of God, that the ultimate source and sanction of all true civil rule and obedience is the will and purpose of God, that behind the things that are seen and temporal are the things that are unseen and eternal. Amen to that, I would say. I couldn't put it better myself, and I hope we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater in the preparation for the coming coronation. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take any points or observations or, or questions. Thank you very much indeed, Dr Bradley, for a very stimulating and entertaining talk. Uh, I'm sure we've all enjoyed that. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we're, and as uh, Dr. Bradley just has just said, uh, we're hopefully now going to move on to questions. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screens, you'll be able to see a, a chat box. You can put typed questions into there. Uh, alternatively, further along the bar, there's a reaction button you can press. And if you hit raise hand, uh, a little hand will come up visible at least to me and uh, I will be able to call you to speak. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions? I or... can see a hand up, Richard yes. Bimson. Yes, we've got a couple there. Right. Uh, Richard Bimson, yes, please. You, you could uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, Dr. Bradley, thank you very much for your lecture and indeed for your book, which I think is an excellent resource for those who are new to the, thing, the subject and, uh, uh, and those who return to it. Um, 
one thing that struck me um, in your discourse about uh, the covenant theory of monarchy is the seeming the, the, the seeming conflict or uh, unnecessary nature of the sorry sorry one thing that struck me was your your, your comments about the, the the recognition and how that seems to contradict the ideas of uh, uh, hereditary monarchy um, and I suppose one thing that occurred to me was that whilst it was uh, very understandable in 1689 why this recognition should be a, should be um, uh, should be included. It seems somewhat odd that the Stuarts and perhaps the Tudors had not got rid of it. And why was why was this? Was this just merely the fact that they thought they didn't need to reform the Libra the Libra regardless? Um, I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, very interesting question, Richard. I, I think probably a bit of both, that they they didn't want to, to fiddle around too much, as you say, the Libra Regali and the, uh, even going back to Dunstan's order, it's almost there. They, they the, 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 On the whole, people have been extremely conservative and not wanted to change things. And I suppose the recognition, I mean, even if you had a sort of high view of divine right of kings, the recognition, I, I don't think it necessarily contradicts a sense of hereditary monarchy to me. I mean, I believe in hereditary monarchy, but I think that the fact that, as it were, you have some kind of act of recognition is, is also important because it, and it, it, it does, you know, allow a, a kind of public acclamation and, and a public recognition of the monarch. So I don't think the Stuarts, I, I, I've never felt that there was any sense, even, even with um, James VI and I or, or, or Charles I of, of wanting to get rid of the recognition, because I, I think it's, it's, it's not contradicting uh, a hereditary monarchy. It's, it's in some sense reinforcing it. I mean, you're not expecting someone to get up as, as in a, a wedding service and suddenly say, no, I don't, I don't want this chap as, as king. Um, I mean, you're right that, that post-1689, obviously the covenant theory, I mean, what, what I say in my book, putting it very simply, is the covenant theory replaces divine right. Um, and, and that's what happens in 1689. And as you say, there's more, there's more room for recognition but I, I think the Stuarts were quite happy to go with, with recognition because I don't, to me, it's not necessarily incompatible with hereditary monarchy because you're, you're really just saying it's, it's, it's kind of giving an, a further endorsement of the public uh, or the representatives of the people are, are affirming the, the legitimacy of, of monarchy and of, of that monarch. But it's, it's, it's an interesting point, but I think that's what I would, would say on the whole. I mean, what's going to be interesting, of course, in the next coronation is what element of recognition we have. The thing that we seem to be being steered towards is that the homage is going to go and that's that's going to be dispensed with. I mean, what we know is, you know, the Queen's coronation took three hours and we've been very clearly told that Charles's coronation is, is probably going to be half the time. So something's going to give and it'll probably be the homage, possibly a bit of the recognition. I don't know. It's it's uh, nobody's told us yet. And the uh, the committees, as we know, meet in some secrecy and leak things out very slowly. But uh, but no, I, 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 to me, there isn't there isn't a particular incompatibility between the two. Thank you. Bradley, uh, could you uh, ask your question, please? Thank you very much indeed, um, Professor, for that uh, talk. You said quite confidently during the presentation that we know that the coronation will be framed within the context of a Book of Common Prayer communion service. Um, I really hope that that is the case. Um, has that in fact been publicly stated? Um, I've got to be slightly careful because I, I have had off the record briefings. Um, I think we can be pretty confident, yes. I mean, as you know, this was something that, that was quite um, up for debate um, uh, for quite a long time as to whether the communion service would remain. But I think I think it's fair to say that, that it's highly likely, perhaps I better not put it any further than that. Um, I, 
Yes, I, I, th I think it's going to be. I mean, I don't think you're right that it's been a, a, absolutely stated. Um, and, and of course, there were, as you know, well know, quite a lot of voices in the Church of England who said that they thought um, it shouldn't be. But my understanding is, I think I put it no further than that, that, that it's, um, it's likely to be. I, I mean, have you heard anything at all on this? No, I would very much like to hear something. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's all gradually going to be leaked out, um, uh, and and I think we'll we'll know before too long. Um, I mean, my sense is that you know we had a lot of people like me and others were making all sorts of suggestions. For example, I was very keen on the coronation, which I think it will remaining essentially a Christian service in Westminster Abbey, but then having something in Westminster Hall, which was a more multi-faith um, ceremony. Now, I and many others have advocated that, but I don't think, I have a sense that's not going to happen because when one, the, the, the programme such as we've had leaked out to us about um, what's happening doesn't seem to leave any room for that. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, everything that one hears suggests that it's going to be much more traditional than we perhaps thought. For example, the coronation oaths, you know, there was a lot of speculation that they would be changed, particularly the, the third oath about maintaining the Protestant reformed religion. And there was a huge amount of speculation about that and the Constitution Unit at University College London, you know, has produced a whole lot of alternative oaths. But I have a strong sense more than a strong sense, because it would have had to have had an act of parliament and there isn't time for it to go through, that we're not going to see any change in the coronation oaths. And that leads me to think that things are going to be, you know, to a large extent, very similar to what they, they have been. So that makes me think we probably will have the um, Book of Common Prayer Communion service. Um, I can't be emphatic about it, but I think it's pretty, pretty likely. We know, if obviously, the king himself is, is you know, better than me, very committed to the Book of Common Prayer. And, and uh, is he one of your patrons or? Yes. Um, and I think he would certainly want it. And uh, I imagine he is, one hopes, <laughs> consulted about these things. Um, the, the communion aspect, I, 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 I just have a strong sense that there is going to be, yes, I mean, I better not go to the wall on it in case I'm wrong. And, <laughs> but um, I have a strong sense it is going to be, yeah. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I wonder if the chairman would permit me to ask a supplementary. Thank you. Um, um, Professor, you um, uh, two, two quotes stood out for me um, with reference to the, the, the coronation. He is no longer an ordinary man, um, one that you used early on. And then another, you said that the king was sustained and fortified by the spiritual power conferred upon him in the abbey. Um, and I immediately thought of the rites of ordination in the Book of Common Prayer. Yeah. And I wonder if you could just say something briefly um, about the similarities or otherwise between the right of uh, coronation and the right of ordination and consecration of bishops, please. Yes, certainly. I mean, very, very close, as 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 as, as I'm sure you 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 well know. I mean, and and always has been, of course. The whole, the anointing, uh, the 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 garb that's worn, the 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 um, the, the garb that the the king will be vested in is is of course absolutely modelled on um, both a, a priest's um, alb and and then a bishop's cope, the the imperial mantle. So at every point, I think there is there are huge similarities between the. Um, coronation of a monarch and as you say the ordination of a priest and the and the consecration of a bishop and um and and of course it goes right back and i mean we, we there's a lot of this in my book um in terms of 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 understanding of of the monarch um the monarch's role um i mean if we go right back obviously to to the old testament and the notion of the monarch as as god's anointed one and and the um the 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 the, the, the messiah of course in 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 um hebrew and the the, the christos in greek and and the, uh, the this sense that um ordination yes it, it it is like a service of ordination deliberately like a service of, of consecration for a bishop very very much so and i think it's it's run through the whole 
coronation service throughout its its history, um, and 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 I think that's very important. Um, and I mean, I obviously say this as somebody who's who's not an Anglican. I mean, confirmed as an Anglican, perhaps means one's always an Anglican. But but um, I, as a Presbyterian minister, it, it still resonates with me that it is like um, an ordination service, and and I think it will resonate with. Uh, what, as I say, we're expecting a, a much more ecumenical um, participation in this, in, in this coronation, but it will still have, and obviously the central, the act of anointing, one would expect to be carried out by the, um, uh, certainly by the Church of England, presumed probably by, well, certainly by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the crowning will be carried out by the Archbishop of Canterbury. So I think it has this very strong sense, yes, of um, replicating, if you like, uh, a, 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 an ordination or consecration. Yes, ab absolutely. And it's it always has done. And I think it's been fundamental to our um, understanding of what happens in that in that service. And one hopes that will be will be picked up, as it were, by the by the media. And and I mean, my worry is, you know, that the, the sort of more sacerdotal and sacred aspects of it will not really be be picked up by the media and we'll 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 focus on whether uh harry's there or you know what who's wearing what hat and everything but let's hope we do get a bit of uh because as we know journalists i mean that's why i quote you know people like jeremy paxman and these sociologists who do seem to appreciate this and i just hope we manage to get that that element over Well, um, following on from that question, I'll, I'll ask my own one, which is um, basically uh, whether there is sufficient um, uh, sufficient knowledge, sufficient uh, sufficient knowledge about uh, what's going on, sufficient trust in the value of what's going on, and sufficient confidence in it uh, amongst uh, people in the, particularly people in the church who have a voice uh, publicly. Um, you know, not all of us do have uh, ready access to channels of communication uh, to, to actually enable people to engage with the meaning of what's going on. Um, I've, I've, I think a, an increasing number of uh, voices I hear are concerned about um, the thinness of what is being spoken about in the public sphere. Um, I, I Prompted slightly by anxiety about this kind of thing, I've written an article, and um, this um, happens to make the same same point you make about the the date. I, I completely agree that I'm, I'm sure St George's Day is in the background of that, but I've not seen that mentioned anywhere. Um, and um, in uh, the various news stories that have popped up about the Stone of Scone, mm. I've not seen anybody pop up to point out that uh, uh, when uh, King James travelled south, when he could very well have uh, done away with anointing in England, having already been anointed in Scotland, um, he, he, the, the, the royal line of Scotland was reunited with the stone and it has a, a slight change in significance. And that's not alluded to in the slightest in any of the public kind of commentary. And um, if someone do, is inspired by this kind of thing and then actually does um, go to church looking for something about it on say that the day after the coronation or the, the weekend after will they find any of what's interested them um i uh, wonder if you have any thoughts on, on that a very very interesting point here and actually yes and i'm interested you 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 pushed there uh, this idea of the 6th of may which does seem i mean as i say I, I only picked it up from these these serbian orthodox but it does seem very significant no i think you're absolutely right uh, i mean you're saying i i was saying it's the sort of secular media and the um and to some extent those around the palace who are embarrassed about some of these things. I mean, this goes back to the, the first book I wrote about the monarchy where people said to me, you know, you don't want to stress the, the sacred aspects of monarchy. We don't, this is not what we want. You know, we, we, we want it to be modern and, and with it. And, and there was the people around um, the palace who were the most um, uh, embarrassed about it. But you're pointing in some senses to the church, which is, I think, a very interesting point, actually. Um, and I, I can't comment about the Church of England and I wouldn't, wouldn't dare to, but um, in our own Church of Scotland, I would say we're not, uh, 
uh, terribly good. I mean, it, it, it's probably very much like you. I mean, we the, 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 we we had a very we had a number of very moving services. I mean, apart from obviously the one in St Giles uh, after the Queen's death, and I was I was preaching at quite a lot of them. And and um, but I I absolutely agree with you that I don't think our churches, particularly the two national churches, probably of, of my one and your one, which both have our close but different relationships with the monarch. Um, I don't think we have made enough of this. And, and I think you're absolutely right. You, as you put it very well, the danger is that somebody going to church, perhaps the day after the coronation or the week before the day, Sunday before the coronation, is probably not going to hear very much about it in the in in the, the sermons and and the service. And um that seems to me very sad. Um and I mean, it obviously reflects a number of things. There are, I absolutely respect those Christians of whom there are many who say, you know, they 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 are Republican inclined because they feel the whole thrust of the gospel is is anti uh, power and authority. And I mean, I, I take that argument on board in the in the book. I don't believe it myself, but I, I respect those who who um, uh, feel that they cannot be monarchists as Christians. I, I, I would take a very, very different view. But, you know, I respect them. But uh, it's there is, as you say, I mean, obviously, those people are, are possibly going to preach against the coronation or something and they're relatively small perhaps but there are a lot of people in the church who are perhaps not who are slightly wishy-washy or indifferent or and it just seems to be it's such a wonderful opportunity to engage you know I come back to this business of of we we we, we have young people who are fired up with with um you know symbols and and love kind of medieval stuff and and it seems to me we we, we really have a, a real opportunity to connect with them here which we're going to lose so i absolutely suggest um uh absolutely endorse what you're saying i'm not sure how we get around it i mean there are a number of issues um you're pointing, I think, very interestingly to the church, which perhaps I hadn't thought of. And, and I mean, are we going to get, you know, I've quoted in, in the talk I've given tonight, a lot of statements by bishops and archbishops. I'm not quite sure we're going to get that this time. Do you? I mean, I, as I say, I don't want to make, um, I'm not stray into the Church of England's <laughs> internal affairs, but I'm not quite sure that we're quite going to get those statements from bishops and archbishops. Maybe, maybe we are, maybe we are. Um, I don't know what you think. <laughs> I think some of what's uh, written on the um, Church of England website uh, about it, it, it makes you worry when there's a, quite a lot of stress is kind of celebrating community, celebrating who we are and um, downplaying some of the kind of elements that you've spoken about that um, people might, uh, you know, pe people might rubbish a bit uh, in the some of the time but when they're actually presented with them in front of them they they find themselves taking more seriously than they expected to but uh, yes i think yeah. that's a very good point and one uh, slightly uh, might hope that people would have learned from the reaction to the queen's death because i think that did surprise a lot of people as i say in terms of how to me people were connecting with the sacred and the the spiritual and and i would hope that as the church we would take from that something that, as you say, is, is rather deeper, perhaps, than, than many think. But anyway, I, I see there's a very interesting, two interesting comments on the chat, actually. Richard Richard Bimson's one about um, restoring the ceremonies in Westminster Hall. Yes, I, I agree with you, absolutely. And I, I think it was, I mean, I was by no means the only person who's been banging on about this for years, but it looks as though we're not going to get it, but, but maybe we will. And then George and Joanna, coma about whether Charles is going to wear a military uniform. Yes, I, I've not, not heard that myself. Um, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, we've had nothing about whether the traditional garments are going to be used. And of course, there's, there's quite a lot of complicated robing and disrobing, and, and usually the anointing would be just um, with the, the monarch in a, in a very simple white linen um, shift and then and then the cloth of gold is put on and the the very much the sacerdotal um garments um very much as as a priest would wear and then eventually a, as a bishop would wear I, I i don't know whether he's going to wear a military uniform that would be as you say might make it all rather more more complicated <laughs> I, I i i that's not yet been revealed has it um but an interesting one yes i don't i don't know what's going to happen on that front 
um, it would make it slightly more difficult. You're right. Any other questions or thoughts? Are, are, are there any other questions that people would like to put? Give people a moment. Um, I think Mr. Benson's come up again. <laughs> Please to go ahead, Mr. Benson. I'm allowed a second question. Oh, definitely. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I noted I can't quite remember exactly what you meant, what you noted about it, about the comments after the last coronation of it overemphasizing the sacerdotal. And I, I wondered if you could just uh, expound on that a bit more and, uh, and what you thought about that and what you think we might possibly see this time and how we might, whilst recognizing the. Um, uh, the religious nature of monarchy, what it might say to the secular world in 2023 as well. Sorry, I missed, I think, the thrust, the, the key words. They're not a very good line, so I'm sorry I didn't hear. You were saying sorry. something that uh, I missed uh, early on in your in your question. Um, I missed the key you, words. You said, you said in your talk that, you, that, that there were some comments after the last coronation about perhaps it overemphasised uh, the religious nature or the sacerdotal nature of the of the uh, um, of the coronation, and if you could expound on that some more, and what you thought we might see in twenty twenty three. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Yes, I was saying. You know, there is obviously a danger um, that you over spiritualize, and and there's also the besetting British sin, which I may uh, possibly be guilty of, of monocolatry, whereby we kind of uh, you know <laughs> idolize the monarchy, and it is it is a uh, uh, has been perhaps one of our, our national um, sins, possibly. Um, I mean, what I was pointing to was the way people like Kingsley Martin and John Grigg um, were very critical in the early days of the Queen's reign because they felt uh, they, 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 it, the sort of sacerdotal aspects had been overdone. Uh, she wasn't being presented. You remember John Grigg went on about her accent and she was sort of uh, like, a, like a rather precious schoolgirl and, and they felt that, that she wasn't being presented sufficiently in a modern way. Now, with Charles, it's very interesting, of course, because, I mean, Charles, in a sense, has, through his time as Prince of Wales, identified himself with, with so many very interesting causes, many of which I would be absolutely 100% in agreement with him. But he certainly not shirked um, controversy and he's certainly not, um, you know, in some ways you could say he's been ahead of the, the game in, in environmental matters and in architecture and, and other things. And whether any of this is going to work its way into the coronation, again, my sense is that actually it's it's going to be very conservative and, and we're not perhaps going to see a huge change. But um, I suppose, are we going to see that same reaction? I don't know. Um, after the coronation of people saying it was all too spiritual, I, I, I don't know. It's very difficult to predict, isn't it? I mean, is there going to be as much, are there going to be sociologists who will sit down as these two did and really analyse the, the popular mood? And I mean, maybe there will. I mean, there's a very interesting sociologist at Manchester called Sheila Robotham who's done a lot of work on um, the effect that royal visits have on people. And I find it fascinating because she herself is, is, is not particularly religious, but she says they, she, they use words like grace and blessing. And it's quite clear that for many people, there's something spiritual going on here. Um, now, if we're going to get sociologists looking at this, it might be very good, but I just, I just don't know. Um, I mean, we're in such a different world from 1953, aren't we? And whether the coronation is going to have quite the same impact, I mean, particularly given everything that's going on um, just now, I mean, will, will it just be a sort of five days wonder? Will sociologists and commentators look at it and either say it was too sacred and too spiritual and, and where this is completely out of touch with a secular post-Christian nation? I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose one slight fear is that the main um, emphasis may be in difference. I mean, the popular press will go wild about whether Harry's there and, and what um, Camilla's wearing and everything, and, and they'll, they'll make their own 
sensationalism out of it, but I just don't know what, I mean, it's a very interesting question you raised there actually, but I, I just don't know whether we will see that same sort of analysis on both sides with, with, with some people thinking this was all much too spiritual and, and religious and, and others saying, um, no, actually it did touch a kind of spiritual nerve. A very interesting question. I, I don't know what the answer is. Somebody else has got their hand up, Mr. Mr. Bird, I think. Brid, Brid, sorry. Yes, uh, the, the Reverend Dr. Michael Bryden, who's our speaker next week. We're getting a oh, speech. yes, from the Isle of Man. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. No, th thank you very much for letting me ask a qu question. Well, it's, it's more of a point. I was very interested in the fact that the 6th of May is kept as the Feast of St. George by some of the Orthodox. Of course, in the prayer book, it's a black letter day for St. John before the Latin gate. Um, St. John the Evangelist is a oh, right. his yes. days. St. John the Evangelist is quite linked into all the legends of Edward the Confessor. Hmm. which links in very neatly with St. Edward's crown. I mean, you know, in case anybody's not familiar with the story, Edward the Confessor is supposed to have given a sapphire to a beggar, who then turns out to be St. John the Evangelist, who sends it back. That's the sapphire which is in the imperial state crown now. I just what I think it's probably a happy coincidence, but I did think perhaps something could be made of that to bring across, you know, the spiritual significance of the coronation. That's extremely interesting. No, I hadn't. I hadn't thought of that actually. Um, that's that's a very interesting point. And as you say, would it nice to have that link with Edward the Confessor? I think that would be um, that would be well worth bringing out again. I don't know how you get it into the <laughs> into the public prints. It's going to be difficult enough getting St George in, and St George is, is is a bit more sort of central. But that, no, that's a fascinating point. I I hadn't picked that up. Um, no, very interesting. And of course, I mean, you, I think it was you, Ian, who was mentioning the Stone of Schoon and um, the connections there. I mean, again, there's such a rich backstory there. With, uh, I mean, however one, however much of the legend one wants to take, but it's wonderful stuff. And, um, uh, you know, again, one feels, I mean, I've just done a very long piece for our Church of Scotland magazine, because there's obviously a lot of interest in it in Scotland. And I mean, I hope we're going to let it out. Of course, as you know, Alex Salmond has said, he doesn't think that Scotland should release it <laughs> until it's independent. But I don't think that's, uh, I don't think he's going to be <laughs> um, in charge of it. But um, no, I mean, there's a lot here, isn't there? Because what you've just brought up about the link with John the Evangelist and, and Edward the Confessor, it's a very rich area and uh, one feels people would be interested in these sort of things but but how one gets them out and and I think it goes back to your point Ian about in the church are we sufficiently uh, interested in it I, I I just don't know I mean I think many are but but the trouble is many are probably not and it's 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 tricky but no that's a very interesting one thank you for raising that Hopefully, through these uh, talks and uh, uh, our other activities, we're doing something to mm. encourage some conversations about that. I hadn't I, I'd noted about the, uh, the, the, the the St. John date, but I hadn't noted the, uh, the, the link to the, the legend of St. St. Edward. I, I love that. No, that's a wonderful one, actually. Um, I mean, you feel there are a lot of local opportunities, don't you, with with so many of our kings and and uh, saints and and uh, that that local churches and local communities. But maybe things are are happening. I, I just don't know. Again, I'm afraid. Um, you know, Scotland is not as monarchical a nation as England is. So <laughs> you're probably doing rather more than we are. We have to battle with a certain amount of. Uh, Republican sentiment, although although there are there are plenty of uh, royalists around, and there are those who are interested in the spiritual and the sacred dimension. But I, I just wonder whether there are local um, things happening with local churches and churches which are associated with Edward or Oswald or or uh, um, any of the, those many many very interesting Anglo-Saxon kings and 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 um, and maybe even with the Stuarts as well. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we haven't. Uh, we we have had one one mention of the Stuarts, but I don't know if any of the king there. The church is dedicated to Charles King and Martyr are, are represented here tonight. <laughs> I used to know the one in Tunbridge Wells, but um, I don't know if if they're doing anything. Nobody's coming clean on this. <laughs> although, I, I, although I, I imagine 
I think Joanna Coma has uh, put in the chat a uh, suggestion of a. Oh, sorry, yes, telegraph. Then, telegraph. From, uh, yes, yes, you could try that. I, I think that probably is part of it that we should all be encouraged to speak up ourselves because I think if we wait for prominent commentators and archbishops to do it for us, we'll, we'll be we'll be waiting a long time, um, and there's no reason that we can't get our pens out and our typewriters out and and, and so on. No, um, I mean, yes, I think that's a very good point. I mean, I'm writing away um, as much as I can about it. And um, I think there are more serious commentators, aren't there, that, who might. I mean, the trouble is that, as we know, when it comes to the actual coronation, it'll be Giles Brandreth or someone sitting with uh, Hugh uh, Edwards. And so you won't be getting a particularly spiritual. <laughs> A spiritual take on it, I think. Um, but um, one one lives in hope that, um, as you say, the more the more serious parts of the press and and the BBC might might pick up some of the. Um, um, I mean, I thought they did pretty well actually with the Queen's the the services, particularly the services around the country after the Queen's death. I mean, the one that particularly impressed me. I don't know if there's anyone from Wales here from the Church in Wales, but the service. In Flandaff Cathedral, I found the most moving of all the, the services after the Queen's death. It was, it was of course, in English and Welsh. It was the Archbishop of Wales who preached. And um, I thought the, the coverage of it, I mean, I watched it all, and it did actually have, it had the former, I think it had Barry Morgan, the former Archbishop of Wales, talking a lot before that service to whoever was the, the, um, the commentator, the anchor, the anchor person. And I felt that actually had more spiritual um, input in terms of the television coverage, the BBC coverage than, than anything else. So maybe we should look to Wales. I don't know how your membership is in Wales of the, of the Prayer Book Society, but maybe they can, they can offer us a, a, a lead here. <laughs> We do. We do have some. We have members. Uh, I think probably even on this call, and certainly usually on these calls, we've had people from uh, across the British Isles and far beyond. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I have a. I noticed yeah. you've got a, a special edition of the prayer book coming out, haven't you? With with the prayers for King Charles, is that right? Um, the, 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 just the, the regular. The prayer book is, has been updated with the uh, prayer book. Yes, it's been updated. And, so yes. on, and uh, that's available through the Prayer Book Society websites and, uh, and other less reputable sources. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, as, as it were, it's a new printing of it, is it? Yeah. Yes, no, that's very good. I mean, one of the issues, of course, is, as you know better than me, is, of course, there's no coronation service in the prayer book. Um, and, and this has raised some questions when I've talked to people about, you know, whether the, the prayers will be the same as they were in 1953 or whether we're going to see a rewriting of the of the actual prayers, because obviously the only thing that would be taken from the Book of Common Prayer is essentially the communion service, isn't it? Well, I've, I've actually... Um... Hug for my own little article on the, on, on the Prayer Society website, which uh, tries to address that because uh, there have historically been um, more elements, at least, uh, but principally the communion service, but also the uh, the, the Veni Creator Spirit. Yes, and, the Veni Creator, uh, yes, and, yes. Uh, the Te Deum from Matins, and um, yes. uh, the Litany historically preceded uh, the, uh, the, 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 the latter parts of the service, and uh, where uh, Private society is encouraging people uh, across the country to make use of the listening in the run up to the uh, coronation, and uh, hopefully it will be said or sung in the abbey on the day. Uh, obviously, like, like everything else, we have we have no better information than anyone else. You probably know better than us. Dr. No, well, I, I no, I don't know about that. That's an interesting point. Yes, I I'd not sort of thought about that. I mean, you haven't had anything to do with this little book that's been produced for daily prayers, have you? If only. Although we would <laughs> take this opportunity to. Um, so if you go to the Prayer Society website, uh, under the, um, uh, the, the the bar uh, for resources, there is a bar, Coronation. And uh, if you look there, there's a whole range of things that we've put out, uh, resources in word, in word format for people to adapt, adapt for services in their own churches. This video series, uh, this talk will be on, on, on that page, hopefully tomorrow. Um, and further links, uh, including to various articles previously published by the Prayer Book Society, uh, my own little article, and uh, a few other bits and bits and bobs and links to external sources. So um, hopefully, although people might not find the most 
confident materials sitting on the Church of England websites. They they, they can find some um, some useful material on our, on our on our website. Oh, that's no, that's good. No, I I just wondered if you'd. Um, I mean, I'm I'm going to use these prayers myself because they're quite good. The way they run through from uh, Easter Day till um, till the day of the. But as as you say, they're very. They're short, but they're certainly not from the prayer book, are they? They're, they're, um... there's, a, there's a handful of prayer book prayers. Oh, there's some, aren't there? Yes, sorry, there are some. I mean, I haven't really the studied. Principle is right. But they've just, as they usually do, they've they've left those of us who are, <laughs> uh, worship in the in the prayer book tradition to um, uh, find our own equivalents rather than uh, yes. providing very much. But as with the, all of these questions, I think we can't expect to have things given to us on a plate and we need to be encouraged to uh, do things ourselves. Um, yes, yes, I think you're maybe right. That's not, maybe that's not bad for us. No, no, and I mean, uh, as, as, as we've said, uh, the king himself, I think, is, is, a, is obviously a very good friend to the prayer book and one would, I would certainly expect that to be reflected in the coronation service. I see, so, sorry, somebody's come on for Felicity saying Tunbridge Wells is represented. So <laughs> whether you're from the church of Charles King and Martyr, I don't know. But <laughs> um, but no, that's that's very good. But it's, no, I mean, I think, um, as you say, what, what, what is going to precede it in terms of church services is a, is a very interesting point that you've really made very well, Ian, that um, we ought to be, and maybe we are kind of building up to it. Um, well, I mean, you are very clearly with, with, these, um, uh, with these seminars and uh, with the prayers you're offering, but one, one just wonders how many churches up and down the land are, are going to be kind of um, looking forward to it. I, I, I just don't have a sort of sense of that at the moment. You probably do more than me. Um, we're, 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 we hear various positive things, but I think there's a lot of work to do to encourage pe people uh, in this. I'm just putting into the chat the link to the uh, Quebec Society Coronation Resources. I probably should have put that in earlier. But, uh, oh, thanks. Yes. So one gets that through your website. No, that's very good. There's, there's quite a lot there, and, and that will be, be added to. And we're encouraging everyone, anyone who does become aware of things happening in their area, uh, using the prayer book yeah, in any form, to uh, to let us know about this, and um, we'll publicise a selection to give a, a bit of a flavour of what's what's what is what, what is happening. And um, um, it's been um, very very helpful to have your your talk this evening, Dr. Bradley. Um, a, a lot to be uh, encouraged by, particularly your comments about the communion service. And, um, well, yes, don't, as I say, I'm not uh, sure it's, it's uh, but I, I, I reasonably confident, I think, that it is going, that is going to remain, I think, yes. I mean, we should, I, I think we're going to know roughly around Easter time what, what, what the structure of the service is, but I, I think, I think we can be reasonably confident, yes, yeah. One rather hopes also, sorry, I, I won't keep going on, probably want to wrap it up. But I mean, the other interesting thing will be if we get back to this sort of sense of the public domain and if we get phrases <coughs> from the prayer book um, used more in, in, in articles. And, and I mean, it's still there, isn't it, in the public consciousness? And um, it would be nice to see echoes of the prayer book in some of the writing about, I mean, um, I quote something, I think, well, I quote a number in, but I mean, the, 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 you'll know it better than me and I'm going to get it wrong, but um, godly uh, kings, princes and governors, is that right? But, but, yes, that's the phrase. I think I think um, I use it actually when I'm... When I'm Christian thinking. kings, princes and governors. Christian kings, yes, Christian kings, princes and governors. And, and it'd just be nice if, if sort of phrases from the prayer book had dropped into... Um, uh, the the sort of discussion and and um, analysis wouldn't it I mean it's and, and obviously that's one of the things you're 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 really existing to do to to keep it um, before us and and those wonderful resonant phrases in in the sort of public consciousness which I think they still are do you do a lot with schools we do try to do things with schools we're trying to do more um... Uh, particularly through the Cranmer Awards, uh, um, and um, um, there, there are various schools that have prayer book society uh, posters about the, the history of the Book of Common Prayer, and we 
uh, running a, a prayer books for choristers scheme. And, um, you know, we, we, have, we have more things in the works. Um, we would like to do to, to do more and um, we'll be looking to do more in uh, the coming years. So uh, hopefully, um, yeah, uh, as, as with a lot of these things, I think possibly in the past we've one, one can lament a great deal that the national authorities don't uh, push the prayer book more. But um, uh, whilst one can continue to lament that a bit, we need to um, yeah doing things ourselves to an extent, and uh, it will um, it will grow because of its inherent strength and because it's so rooted in um, in, 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 in scripture and um, points towards truth. Yes, no, and it's. I mean, are you? Is there a sort of comparable society for the authorized version of the Bible? I've never come across. No, it. No, no, there isn't. I mean, isn't there? Interesting point. This uh, in the um, earliest days of uh, the prayer book society, there was a proposal that uh, the society would cover the authorized version, and it was actually uh, partly on the advice of uh, Geoffrey Fisher, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, mm. uh, came to focus on the. On the prayer book specifically, and I don't think anyone has ever made an authorized version of society. No, that's it's curious, isn't it? Because I mean, I, there's a lot of interest in the authorized version in Scotland, partly, of course, because James the Sixth initiated discussion about it in Burnt Island um, Parish Church, which is currently threatened with closure, which is very worrying. But I mean, I, I lecture, for example, regularly to um, students who are not divinity students, but they they are just very interested in in the the whole origins of the authorized version and its impact on obviously on on literature and and you know in a sense you can't understand English literature without knowing it and you could say a bit the same about the prayer book and it, it just strikes me that um, if you somehow got together I mean the, 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 there seems to me to be a huge amount of interest in the authorized version of the Bible whereas the prayer book is presumably a largely an Anglican thing although not entirely but um, the authorized version is is as I say, I mean, and, and certainly in the Church of Scotland, there'd be a lot, lot of people uh, who would still use it, and it's um, uh, very much loved. And and I, I just wonder if there's the sort of mileage in in combining the two, in a sense. Well, I, I certainly hope that the authorized version is also is again used in the coronation, as it has been yes. in previous coronations, as is the pattern in the. Uh, Prayer because obviously that was one of the things that was updated, uh, not the Psalms, but uh, the mm. Gospels were all updated in 1662. Um, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll come back to it, but I'm, I'm concerned to hear about uh, Burnt Island Church. Some of it, so I'm sure they won't do anything to the church. Up. Some of my ancestors are, uh, are buried there. Really? Yes. No, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say we have an absolutely horrendous policy at the moment in the Church of Scotland of getting rid of 40% of our churches were 40 percent in five i've just heard today actually in in inverness presbytery 60 percent um and and huge numbers of historic i'm on a committee which is trying to save them but burnt island is one of the ones that showed you for closure no and as, as you all well know it's a wonderful church and uh, wonderful. No, it's, it's, it's very it's, important part in the you know in the history of um uh christianity in uh, absolutely these islands because of the yes. yeah yeah no anyway that's a separate point but it's it's a rather sad no, no, to end on but i i well I, is it, I, I will uh wrap up at the point but um <laughs> you know there's a lot to a lot to be encouraged by there's a lot to pray about as well Indeed. christianity in these isles and uh, our attention to the the wellsprings of our uh, faith and our ability to communicate about this and uh, um, hopefully the coronation one way and another will be some stimulus to uh, to, to, to that. Uh, thank you very much for your... your no, your thank you very much. No, no, it's no, been great to have you here. And uh, I hope that uh, many of those who have persisted with us uh, to the end of this uh, talk um, will be joining us again and those who are watching afterwards for next Wednesday's uh, talk, the final in our se one in our series from Reverend Dr. Michael Bryden, who we heard speaking earlier. Ah, yes. Uh, his talk will be on... Uh, the coronation and the Bible.